Welcome to worship. It is an absolutely beautiful evening on this Wednesday night. And so I wanted to take this opportunity to share worship with you outside here in the garden. This is our prayer garden at the church and you are always welcome to stop by and spend a few moments quietly in prayer uh, if you'd like to. So welcome to worship. Uh, I wanted to, before we begin our time of prayer and uh, talk about our psalm tonight, I wanted to just let you know that we have an exciting opportunity for worship coming up on August 23rd. So that's gonna be our outdoor worship at Pioneer Park. It's an opportunity for us to be able to spend time together at the park, plenty of space for us to socially distance and bring our chairs. And so we want to invite you to participate in that and be part of it at 10 o'clock on August 23rd. That's a Sunday. So if the weather's really bad, we'll come and meet in the, C the Community Life Center as we have. Um, but Lord willing, the, the weather will be great and we can all worship together on August 23rd at 10 a.m. There will be a radio broadcast av available as well if you want to stay in your car. Um, and uh, we will be posting it online as well. So please come and join us for that. And now I invite us to prepare our hearts for worship. We're going to pray. Uh, we're going to meditate on one of my favorite psalms again. And then we'll share some music. So let's pray. Gracious and holy God, we are reminded on days like this of the love you have for us, that you would create this beautiful world for us to live in and enjoy and to spend time with you. So as we spend this time outside tonight, I pray that, uh, that you would speak into our hearts to bring us peace and comfort and even perhaps a word of challenge as we grow more ever into your image. Lord, I pray for those who might be having worries on their minds or anxieties in their hearts tonight. I pray that you would give them peace. For those who are struggling with illnesses, whether it be COVID-19 or others, um, I pray healing. I pray courage and strength to them. And for all of us, as we prepare for the fall season to start, whatever that looks like for us, and even if we have no idea yet what that looks like, uh, Lord, I pray that we would trust you because you go before us and we are not alone. So thank you, Lord, for your presence. And I pray that, um, that we would be mindful of your Holy Spirit as we worship together tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, I wanted to begin and end our time tonight with joy. Um, there's a lot of bad news out there right now. And as Pastor Pete uh, challenged us this past Sunday in our worship service, I wanted to try and take an opportunity to share joy tonight. So first I wanted to talk with you about a news story that I saw just this morning about a florist. What does a florist have to do with joy? Uh, well, his name is Lewis Miller and he is a successful florist in New York City of all places. And what he has done for the past few years is randomly he will go out early in the morning, long before it's light out, and he'll pick a random spot in the city. Maybe it's a subway station, maybe it's a light pole, uh, maybe, maybe it's a pile of cardboard boxes. And he will deck it out with flowers, just beautiful arrangements of fresh flowers that could be six feet tall or more. And he does that just to bless people. Because what would you do if you walked by a random display of gorgeous flowers? you'd stop, wouldn't you? You'd look at it and you'd smell it and you'd appreciate the beauty that's right there in front of you. And in recent months, since the COVID-19 outbreak, he's actually focused his efforts on areas outside of hospitals because he wants to bless those people who are out there on the front lines, uh, risking so much for our good. And I thought that was a beautiful story of someone who is infecting the world with joy. I just thought it was beautiful. And um, we're gonna post some pictures up here so you can see his work and you can just Google it. It's called Flower Flash. If you Google Flower Flash, you'll be able to see more of his work. So I wanted to open us with that, just as an image of beauty and joy that we can carry with us. And our Psalm tonight talks about joy kind of in a roundabout way. So we've been talking about Psalms for a pandemic. And there is so much wealth of language and beauty and words to help describe what it's like to go through a hard time. 
And so what a great way for us to do that. We're gonna do that for just a couple more weeks and then we have something special in store for our next series, which I won't tell you about yet. But for now, I wanted to share with you a psalm that has meant a lot to me for many years. And it's a very unique one. We're going to talk a little bit about that. But first, let me read from it. I'm going to read from Psalm 90. And we're going to read verses 1 to 6, and then verse 10 and 12 to 17. So I'm just going to read right through that. You can follow along on the screen as well. Lord, you have been our help, generation after generation. Before the mountains were born, before you birthed the earth and the inhabited world, from forever in the past, to forever in the future, you are God. You return people to dust, saying, go back, humans, because in your perspective, a thousand years are like a yesterday past, like a short period during the night watch. You sweep humans away like a dream, like grass that is renewed in the morning. True, in the morning it thrives, renewed, but come evening it withers, all dried up. We live at best to be 70 years old, maybe 80 if we're strong. But their duration brings hard work and trouble because they go by so quickly and then we fly off. Teach us to number our days so that we can have a wise heart. Come back to us, Lord. Please, quick, have some compassion for your servants. Fill us full every morning with your faithful love so we can rejoice and celebrate our whole life long. Make us happy for the same amount of time that you afflicted us, for the same number of years that we saw only trouble. Let your acts be seen by your servants. Let your glory be seen by their children. Let the kindness of the Lord our God be over us. Make the work of our hands last. And he says it one more time. Make the work of our hands last. Well, Psalm 90 begins book four of what in fancy church language we call the Psalter. And that's really just the book of Psalms. Like the Jewish Torah, this collection of prayers and songs is actually divided into five books, like Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. Well, here we have five different books of Psalms within the large book of Psalms. And book four contains Psalms 90 to 106. See, the Psalms are a collection of songs and prayers, as I'm sure you know now, that were written over a span of hundreds of years throughout the history of the Jewish people. And the latest ones we think perhaps were written around 150 years or so before Christ was born, maybe a little bit more. And it's true that the Psalms usually are attributed to David. We kind of think of David as the one who wrote them. And likely he did write many of them. But the interesting thing is that he didn't actually write all of them. In fact, we have some psalms that were written by someone named Asaph. We have psalms written by a group of people called the Sons of Korah. And Psalm 90, which is the one we're looking at today, is actually attributed to Moses. It's the only one in the whole collection of psalms that is said to be written by him. It calls him Moses, the man of God. Now, it's true, we don't have Moses' signature on this psalm. so. It's possible, and it may even be likely, that it was written later and hidden away for safekeeping. And then one day, uh, a pious Jewish scribe brought it out of hiding and dusted it off. And then, to him, it sounded an awful lot like something Moses could have said. So maybe that's what we're looking at. It's something that someone later came along and read and thought, that sounds a lot like Moses. I'll bet he could have written it. But the interesting thing about this psalm is that it doesn't really say anything about Moses' life. It doesn't mention Pharaoh or the Israelite exile into the wilderness or anything related to that story. So what is it about this psalm that makes us think it sounds like Moses? Well, I think that it's the character of this prayer that reminded that ancient scribe of the great prophet Moses, who was a friend of God, like David. This is the interesting thing about this psalm. It's, a, it's what's called a communal lament. 
All that means is that it's written on behalf of the Jewish people as a whole, the whole worshiping community. Some psalms are individual psalms. This one is a communal psalm. It talks a lot about us and we. And so it starts out by establishing who God is in this psalm almost as if it's reminding God of who God is. I mean, look at verse 1. It says, Lord, you have been our help. And the word there is ma'on. So it means help. It can also mean refuge or dwelling place. But it even has a more intimate feeling, too. It means home. You've been our home, God. You've been our safe place where we could turn for refuge. So it establishes that this is who God is and this is who we believing people believe God to be. But then in verse 10, it turns and the poet begins to lament. And this often happens in the Psalms. He says in verse 10, we live at best to be 70 years old or maybe 80, but we work hard and it's not easy. And those years go by so fast. And then we fly off, the psalmist says. We have such a brief and fragile life, and then it's gone, and so much of it, is, of it is hard. We long sometimes, like it says in verse 12, to just step back and be able to take stock and try to gain a bit of wisdom in all of this. We pray, God, help us to number our days. Help us to take stock of our lives and find wisdom in all of this. But here's where we get to the meat of this lament, and it's in verse 13, when the psalmist cries out to God, Come back to us, Lord. We've established in verse 1 who God is. God is our ma'on, our home, our place of refuge. But somehow it feels like we haven't had that all the time. And so the psalmist prays on behalf of the people, Come back. Literally, the Hebrew says, Turn literally turn around it feels like your back has been to us lord turn around shuv is what it says have some compassion for us our lives are so brief and so hard have compassion for us and i think this is what sounds like moses in this psalm it's a it's a direct command it's almost like moses is saying hey get over here <laughs> Pay attention to us. And, you know, this is exactly the kind of conversations that Moses had with God in Scripture. That's why I think it sounds like him, and it did to that ancient scribe. See, Moses and God talked like they were friends or even brothers. They, they spoke on that level. They argued with each other, and they complained, and they moaned about stuff to each other. And... Moses even calls God to account in the story of the Exodus. Moses says to God, hey, God, don't abdicate your responsibility. We are your people. Pretty amazing, huh? I don't know if you believe me, but that's what happens. So I wanted to take a little time just to share with us a scripture from the book of Exodus, which I think helps us to understand this psalm a little bit more and why it sounds so much like Moses. So I'm going to take us to Exodus 32, verses 1 to 14, and you'll see the text up there. I'll read a little and explain a little, but you'll get to follow along with the text. So what's happened before this chapter is that Moses has been up on a mountain with God, uh, communing with God, talking with God, making plans with God about these people who are taking this brave journey out of slavery and into freedom. And they're kind of in the middle right now in the wilderness. And what happens is he's up there a long time and the people begin to doubt and they begin to get worried and, and they begin to wonder if he's ever coming down. You know, what if something happened to him on the way up the mountain or on the way back down? What if, what if he just left us? They begin to doubt. And so it says in verse 1 that when the people saw that Moses was taking a long time to come down, they gathered around his brother Aaron and they said to him, come on, make us gods who can lead us. As for this man, Moses, who brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we don't have a clue what has happened to him. We're done with Moses. We don't know what happened. We're feeling anxious and nervous, and we just, we'd rather just have our own leader. Thank you very much. 
So Aaron says to them, all right, he gives in to them and he, and he says, take out all your jewelry, we'll melt it down, we'll make a god. So he collects all of those things and he makes an image of a bull calf. Now, the interesting thing about this is that that image is actually a pagan god named Baal, who was really well known and popular in that region. So it's almost like the Israelites aren't just saying, we're done with Moses. It's kind of like they're saying, we're done with our with the Israelite God. We're, we're kind of done with I am, and we'd rather go with what we know. So we're going to make this idol, and we're going to worship it. So Aaron does this. He builds the altar, and then he says, tomorrow we're going to have a party. We're going to have a festival to our new God that we've made. And so they get up the next day, and they offer offerings, and they get up and have a party. So the Lord notices this, of course, and he, he's up on the mountain with Moses, and he says, you need to go down there. Your people, he says, not my people, your people whom you brought up out of the land of Egypt are ruining everything. They've abandoned the path that I've commanded. They made a metal bull calf for themselves. They bowed down to it and offered sacrifices. So they've kind of rejected Moses and God. And so the Lord has kind of had enough at this point, And he says to Moses, I've been watching these people and I've seen how stubborn they are. Now leave me alone. Let my fury burn and devour them. Then I'll make a great nation out of you. So the Lord in this story is just d kind of done with the people and he's ready to start over with Moses. But listen to what happens in verse 11 of chapter 32 of Exodus. It says, but Moses pleaded with the Lord his God. And he said, Lord, why did your fury burn against your own people whom you brought out of Egypt with great power and amazing force? Why should the Egyptians say he had an evil plan to take the people out and kill them in the mountains and wipe them off the earth? Calm down your fierce anger. Change your mind about doing these terrible things to your own people. Literally, the Hebrew says, turn from your fierce anger. Shuv, there it is again. Turn away from your anger and change your mind. Remember Abraham, Isaac, and Israel. Remember your promises to your people. And guess what happens? The Lord changes his mind. Moses argues with God. He pleads with him. He reminds God of God's promises to God's people. And God relents and changes his mind. That's what makes this psalm sound like Moses. Because in this psalm, the poet says the same thing. Turn around, God. Have compassion on us, your people. You know, I think that we've kind of come to this collective conclusion. I'm not sure how we did, but we have this idea that we have to be nice to God. Do you ever feel like that? I've got to be nice to God. I have to make sure and say the right things because I don't want to make God mad at me, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say the right things. We don't always say the honest things. Maybe we don't feel like, for whatever reason, we don't feel like we can be honest. Maybe it's because we've kind of begun to think that we have to be nice in church and we're not supposed to be honest there either and so we expect God to kind of be the same way. Maybe it's because so many of us think of God as an, an old white man with a long beard seated peacefully in heaven watching us and so we have to walk on eggshells around God <laughs> and try to make him like us. But Moses teaches us that it's okay to be honest with God. It, it's even okay to go, call God to account, to say, God, turn toward us, make things right. Be who we believe you to be, be who you've promised to be. It's okay to say those prayers. That's pretty much what the poet is saying in this Psalm. And, and by drawing on the person of Moses, the poet is kind of cluing us in to the kind of prayers we can pray. We can pray honest prayers. We can be direct like Moses. We don't have to use pretty language or say pretty please or tiptoe around God in our prayers because God can take our honesty just like he did Moses. Do you believe prayer actually changes things? I mean, honestly, do you actually believe 
that your prayers make a difference in what happens in your relationships and in our community and on this planet. Moses did, and his prayers changed things. So I want to ask you, where in your life are you saying enough is enough? What is making you frustrated and even angry right now? I want to encourage you to pay attention to that and then give it to God. Be honest with God. I mean really honest. And let God have it. It's okay. Because it can be in those places where we are riled up that God gives us the passion to allow change to happen. Be honest with God. Sometimes enough is enough. And it's okay to say that to God. Well, this psalm ends with a beautiful prayer for joy, a beautiful lament um, for God to honor God's promises. So it says in verses 14 to 17, Fill us full every morning with your faithful love so that we can rejoice and celebrate our whole life long. Make us happy for the same amount of time that you afflicted us, for the same number of years that we saw only trouble. Let your acts be seen by your servants. Let your glory be seen by their children. Let the kindness of the Lord our God be over us and make the work of our hands last. Fill us every morning with your faithful love. Have you ever woken up on the right side of the bed? (laughs) I know we talk about waking up on the wrong side of the bed. I've done that plenty of times. You wake up and you're rehearsing all of the things you wish you'd done differently the day before. You're thinking about all the stuff you have to do. And before you've even gotten out from under the covers, you're in a bad mood. I've been there plenty of times. But have you ever woken up on the right side of the bed? Here the psalmist is asking God, fill us with your faithful love. Essentially he's praying, wake us up on the right side of the bed (laughs) every morning. Fill us with joy. Give us reasons to party. I don't know about you, but that sounds great to me right now. (laughs) Maybe we can pray for good mornings, waking up on the right side of the bed. Well, do you need joy today? (laughs) Do you need to wake up on the right side of the bed? I know I need some joy, especially now. Well, we opened our time today with a shot of joy of some beautiful images. And I want to invite you this week to just seek out opportunities for joy, either to create it or to receive it. Be open to it. Turn off the news for a little bit. I know it's hard but turn it off and look at something beautiful instead. It has been a spectacular summer, as we can see even tonight. So get out and enjoy it. Find some joy and hunt it down if you have to. We can do this. We can do this together. As we close, I said I'd begin and end with joy. And this past Sunday, we shared a lovely moment of joy at the end of Pastor Pete's message. I want to play it again for us, just as we close our time, to inject a bit of joy into your day. I pray that it will be a blessing to you and that the joy of the Lord will be your strength today and every day. God bless you in Jesus' name. To kind of pull us together, uh, I'm going to invite the musicians, if they would join me, I am going to take us to a song that's written by a Methodist minister in England. He took these words from Luke chapter 4 and put them to song. And the thing I like about it is is I can see him sitting looking at these words and discovering the capacity not just to sing a song, but perhaps to dance a song. So... So we're going to sing those words from Luke 4, but you'll discover they're the kind of words that invite us to dance because when you dance, you're happy, you smile. Anyone fans of Snoopy, Peanuts cartoon? And when Snoopy starts dancing, that kind of... So 
so we're going to sing this song, but I'm going to invite you, I'm going to invite you guys at home just to make yourself foolish for a moment. And if the song, you can't sit for this, if the song actually invites your feet to move, can you do that? Can you guys do it at home? It's easier at home because you can be foolish in your own lounge, but, but you can be foolish here too. I really want to invite us. Let's, let's dance a bit. If you're sitting with a family member, God doesn't mind dancing, by the way. God invented dancing. So for you guys who are here, you're going to have to stand, I promise you. It gets divided into two parts. There's the bidding part that I will lead, and then we go into the chorus, and everybody else will join me, and that's the moment you have permission to dance all around this place and to dance all around your home. God's Spirit is in my heart. He has called me and set me apart This is what I have to do What I have to do He sent me to give the good news to the poor Tell prisoners that they are prisoners no more Tell blind people that they can see and set the downtrodden free and go tell everyone the news that the kingdom of God has come and go tell everyone the news that God's kingdom has come just as the Father sent me so I'm sending you out to be my witness throughout the world, the whole of the world. He sent me to give the good news to the poor, tell prisoners that they are prisoners no more, tell blind people that they can see. And set the downtrodden free And go tell everyone The news that the kingdom of God has come And go tell everyone The news that God's kingdom has come Do, do Americans dance? <laughs> we do. We, we can do one of these, right? I see a few of you out there. Okay. I don't know about you at home, <laughs> but there's a few. Don't worry what you have to say. Don't worry because on that day, God's Spirit will work in your heart. Will speak on, in your heart. He sent me to give the good news to the poor Tell prisoners that they are prisoners no more Tell blind people that they can see And set the downtrodden free And go tell everyone The news that the kingdom of God has come And go tell everyone the news that God's kingdom has come. Wait, wait. He sent me to give the good news to the poor. Tell prisoners that they are prisoners no more. Tell blind people that they can see. And set the downtrodden free. And go tell everyone. The news that the kingdom of God has come And go tell everyone The news that God's kingdom has come